a, a very good and um, very topical and uh, a very interesting uh, subject to discuss uh, with a great panel of, um, of speakers uh, on Black Sea, gas, economic, and, and we will be looking at the economic and the geopolitical implications of the Black Sea in this uh, gas uh, domain. Now, of course, we know that the region of the Black Sea has been the center of um, a lot of economic activity and it's been the, there have been regional initiatives uh, that have been dealing with the Black Sea, but lately also the Black Sea has taken a lot of importance as well since Turkey unveiled uh, uh, the biggest uh, uh, natural gas ever found uh, in this area. And, and uh, that uh, is something that shows us that there is a lot of potential there but at the same time, uh, we have been dealing a lot with the Eastern Mediterranean and what's happening there as an area of a lot of uh, gas and energy, but also a lot of conflict energy as well. So we thought that it might be also too good to compare and see what's happening on the other side of the littoral coast of Turkey. Um, and in that sense, we will be addressing a number of things today with our speakers uh, in order to understand better what kind of discoveries in the Black Sea we're talking about, what are the economic implication of them, uh, then what is the potential uh, of those uh, discoveries, what are the geopolitical implications of that as well. That leads us also to comparison with the Eastern Mediterranean as well, where things are much more heated as opposed to the Black Sea area, which appears to be um, much more collaborative and cooperative among the little countries. So these are some of the issues that we will be talking about today. And um, with me in the panel, uh, very, very pleased to introduce you the speakers, one after the other. First, I will start with Okan Yardemje, who is an academic visitor at Oxford with us at CSOX, but also the co convener of uh, this uh, webinar. It wouldn't have been possible without Okan and his experience and knowledge of the facts, but also the people that um, would uh, compose our panel. Um, now, Okan has been um, working with the Energy Market Regulatory Authority uh, of Turkey since 2006, so there's a long experience there in terms of his knowledge. He, and he also holds teaching positions uh, at um, uh, Middle East Technical University, uh, Bilkent and Hacettepe, where he teaches those uh, issues. Uh, he's got a, a BA from uh, uh, METU, uh, an MBA from uh, Atilim University, an LLM from uh, Penn State University, and a PhD from Hacettepe University. So a lot of degrees there. Uh, Okan for you. Uh, then uh, we, uh, Okan will start by giving us the state of play in a way, but uh, the benefit with Okan is that he has both a very technical knowledge, but also a kind of more political knowledge of the issues. Um, and then uh, we move with uh, uh, Jonathan Lam, who is um, an analyst um, at uh, Wood and Company, an oil and gas analyst for the past five years, and he's been uh, working a lot on uh, emerging uh, economies in Europe, including Turkey, Poland, Romania, Hungary, and uh, Greece. And um, gas is the focus of his attention. Uh, and previously, he spent 20 years working in the downstream oil business in Turkey, including for refining company to Pras. So he knows very well both the country, but also the theme. He has a degree in chemical engineering. Then Anna Mikulska, who is uh, a non-resident fellow in energy studies at the Center for Energy Studies at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. Her research focuses on the geopolitics of natural gas within the EU, the former Soviet bloc, and Russia. She is also senior fellow at University of Pennsylvania's Kleinman Center for Energy Policy where she teaches graduate level seminars on energy policy and geopolitics of energy. Uh, she has uh, a degree, uh, a law degree from Ada, uh, Ada Mikiewicz, uh, um, Mikiewicz University, a master's degree in international relations at the uh, University of Windsor in Canada, and a PhD in political science at the University of Houston. I'm sorry that I destroyed the name of the Polish university. And now Anna is actually in Pennsylvania. So we thought uh, if you want to have any questions on uh, uh, the recent elections, you don't ask them today. And then we move uh, uh, with Dimitar Bechev, who has just joined us. We're very happy to say there were some uh, technical glitches. Um, and Dimo is obviously an old uh, kind of uh, partner of uh, CSOX. He has been one of the 
co-founders of uh, Southeast European Studies at Oxford together with uh, myself. So we go a long way back. Uh, and then um, uh, at, at, at the moment, uh, uh, he has come back from the United States. He is a senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Eurasian Center. He is also a fellow at Europe's Futures Program at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. He has an affiliation with the Department of Politics and International Relations uh, in Oxford uh, currently. And um, uh, he has published extensively on uh, Southeast European politics, political economy, and energy. His book, among others, The Rival Power, is about Russia in Southeast Europe, is one of the point of reference, actually, on what Russia has been doing in Southeast Europe. And uh, at the same time, you may um, uh, have uh, read uh, uh, Dimitar uh, because he's a frequent contributor to foreign policy, uh, Al Jazeera online, uh, Politico, and EU Observer. And with that, uh, I will then uh, pass the uh, button uh, and the floor to Okan to start with his uh, own kind of introduction and the state of play, and then we'll move with the other speakers. Um, we have asked them to speak for 12 minutes. And then there will be a question and answer session. I would like to ask you, please, if you could post, if you could put your um, uh, your uh, questions in the question and answer session, and not in the chat. The chat is only for Julie Adams, who's uh, hidden behind the CISOX logo, to put the short uh, bios. Um, and then I stop. Okan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oton. Uh, good afternoon from Oxford. Uh, good evening to uh, good evening to Southeastern Europe, uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, good morning to America. And if we have participants from Far East, uh, good night. Uh, as Oton mentioned, uh, mentioned today, we have a wonderful group of people to discuss the Black Sea gas today. And I know you are all waiting for the speakers. Uh, so do I. But before giving floor to our first speaker, Jonathan, I just want to give a brief uh, introduction to the topic with some uh, points. And my first point is why are we, uh, can, could be a, an answer to this question, why are we still talking about the fossil based energy sources? So this figure shows us uh, the uh, primary en energy consumption by source in the world and the gray uh, box represents the oil share. Uh, the pink one is the natural gas, the black one is coal. So at the beginning of 21st century, uh, the share of fossil-based energy sources were 87%. Uh, despite several uh, policy implications, uh, regulations, support to the renewable energy uh, sources, uh, feeding tariffs, uh, especially in the second decade, uh, European Union's Green Deal, um, the, the share of the uh, uh, fossil-based uh, energy sources has not been changed significantly. Yes, we are uh, in a transition period from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. On the other hand, unfortunately, the transition period will not be easy and uh, it will take some time. This, this was the first point. And my second point is about the offshore technology. 30 years ago, we had an ability to drill at the water depth of 7,000 feet uh, with the fourth generation drill ships. And during the time, uh, the, not only the uh, depth of water, but also the total depth of wells increased rapidly. And thanks to the sixth, uh, generation, sixth generation drill ships, now we have an ability to drill in the whole uh, Black Sea region. Still not in the whole Mediterranean. Uh, we cannot drill at the deepest level of the Mediterranean, but we can drill at the whole uh, Black Sea uh, today. And these technological improvements give also us a clue about one reason uh, of the rising tension in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, when the human kind reach the uh, source, of course, the allocation uh, of the source problem uh, could be arising as we can see in the Eastern Mediterranean. And maybe we will see more, uh, I hope not, in the oceans or uh, outer space. Let's focus on the uh, Black Sea again. The other point is the unconventional sources. The region is very rich uh, in terms of unconventional sources, uh, specifically gas hydrates are promising. I don't want to go to the details, uh, and this picture shows us the Fatih drill ship, uh, the Turkey's first drill ship, 
uh, which derailed four wells in the Eastern Mediterranean and then sailed to the Black Sea um, at the beginning of this year. And this video shows the moment of uh, the derail bit that tugs the uh, seabed of the Black Sea. It is not an easy, it is not a, a cheap operation, but as you all know, Turkey is investing uh, to offshore technology, not only in the Black Sea, but also in the Eastern Mediterranean. Mediterranean. And Kalanuni is the second ship, which is on the way to the Black Sea. And as you know, one uh, another drill ship, Yavuz, is operating in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean. There are some uh, seismic vessels, two uh, seismic vessels are also in the Eastern Mediterranean, and one of them is expected to go to the Black Sea in the upcoming uh, weeks, as stated by the Minister of Energy. And there are lots of supply vessels, as well as naval in the, in the um, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean. So the second point is Turkey is still investing uh, not only in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean, but also in the Black Sea. The third point is about the maritime boundary of the region. Uh, in terms of maritime boundary, we can say it is more, uh, comparing to the Eastern Mediterranean, it is more a stable uh, region. Uh, we had just one case between Romania and Ukraine, one dispute uh, until 2009 due to the Serpent Island. And uh, they went to the International Court of Justice, as you know, and uh, according to the uh, ICJ decision, uh, they, they determined the uh, maritime boundary between Ukraine and Romania gave a partial right to Serpent Island. And surprisingly, between 2009 and 2014, the region was uh, dispute free in terms of uh, maritime boundaries uh, delimitation uh, until the uh, annexation of Crimea by uh, Russian Federation. And this shows the uh, impact of the uh, occupation on the uh, exclusive economic zone. Uh, and regarding the oil and gas fields, we have to focus on the western side of the region. And as you can see, uh, the the uh, stars are the uh, wells and the black shape, the, the black uh, area is the first uh, significant gas discovery in the region, Neptune deep field of Romania. And Turkish uh, Sakarya field is very close to that. It is expected to be around five to 10 times of the amount of Neptune deep. And I would like to conclude this map, uh, this black sea map with two famous uh, pipelines. One of them is Blue Stream, as you know, and the second one is Turk Stream from Turkey to uh, from Russia to Turkey. And I know uh, Anna and Dimitri will focus more on the pipelines and the extension of Turk Stream to uh, Balkans and uh, the other European uh, countries. My last slide is about the comparison of gas discoveries in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Black Sea. The on the left side, you can see the Eastern Mediterranean gas amounts, uh, the, the gas discoveries, uh, the, the uh, blue uh, rectangles represents the amounts in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And the biggest one is Dohur field in Egypt, uh, Leviathan Israel, Tamar field Israel, and the other fields in Cyprus, as well as the uh, green one uh, represents the uh, gas discoveries in the Black Sea, Sakarya and Neptune. So this is just for a quick comparison, how big are we talking about? And one of the, some of the blue ones are 1P or 2P. I don't want to go to details of the reservoir engineering, but we are more sure about the amount uh, in some Eastern Mediterranean fields, of course, and the Black Sea, they are potential gas resources, but it is just for a quick comparison. And I, I believe Jonathan will uh, focus more on the economic side of the uh, reserves. So this is all about the introduction. Thank you very much for listening. I uh, am looking forward to hear first our, uh, first of all, our first speaker, Jonathan. Uh, so Jonathan, the floor is yours. Um, hello, everybody. First of all, I'll try and find my um, slides. Um, see if I can share the screen. So as Orkan said, um, I'm interested in talking here about the economic side of the, the tuna discovery of the Sakaria um, 
gas field. And um, one of the things that I, I noticed when the discovery was made is that um, people kind of fell into two different groups, the group that thought it was the best thing since sliced bread and the group that thought it was actually nothing, um, including people who were saying, are they lying here? Um, I want to take a slightly more um, analytical view of, of what's going on. So first of all, if we look at uh, Turkish energy, the Turkish uh, economy is around about $750 billion in size in, in 2019. That's a World Bank um, number. And it's a country that has run a current account deficit um, for decades. Um, 2019 was, was different because the Turkish lira lost a lot of value and, and imports went, went down. Um, but normally over the last few years, they've been running a current account deficit of about 35 billion US dollars per year. And um, Turkey is a country that imports most of its energy. And if you look at the import bill, and the size of the current account deficit, if Turkey could produce all of its own energy, um, the, the current account deficit would pretty much disappear, all other things being equal. Um, and this is something which has, has led, I think, sometimes to some exaggerations about the, the find here, because um, we're talking gas, and the, the gas import bill last year was around about 12 billion US dollars. 40 billion US dollars is, is all of Turkey's energy, um, and most of that is oil. In the last couple of decades, um, the, the Turkish infrastructure, gas infrastructure, has developed um, substantially. Turkey's in a, you could say, enviable place if you want to be a gas buyer, because it's, it's located next door to some of the world's biggest producers of gas, um, very heavily reliant on Russia, um, traditionally, Blue Stream, was uh, the biggest source of gas to Turkey for quite a long time. Um, but Turkey's also been importing gas from Iran since 2001, from Azerbaijan since 2007, and recently with the completion of the TANAP pipeline, uh, which brings Shah Deniz gas from the Caspian right through to Turkey and on into Europe, um, Turkey now has access to another 10 BCM of, of Azeri gas as well. So Azerbaijan has uh, potentially becomes a much more important supplier of gas to Turkey. Um, then there's connections to, to Greece and Bulgaria. Turkey's pro provided a small amount of gas to Greece for a long time. Um, the first gas that came from Russia to Turkey came down through Bulgaria, but that pipeline is no longer needed. So there's, there's potential for um, shifting gas from the east of Turkey through Turkey into, um, into the region. One of the most, I think one of the, the biggest successes that those running the Turkish energy market have had in, in the last few years is that they've been able to take great advantage of the surplus of LNG in the world. So Turkey now has um, a couple of operating floating storage and re, uh, regasification units, and there's another project on the way, um, a couple of land-based terminals for LNG. And if we look at the numbers for the first half of 2020, gas imports were down, you know, economic activity is lower like in Turkey, like many other places because of COVID. But pipeline gas was down 22.8%, while LNG volumes were up 44.8%. So there's been a very big shift from pipeline gas to LNG in Turkey in the last year. It was, there was also a big shift in, two, in 2019. Um, and Turkey's buying from like 10 different countries, um, this gas, some of it is on long term contracts, some of it is, is uh, spot. And I think this is an important point to make because it shows that Turkey's already in a position with a lot more flexibility. Um, it's not as, re as reliant on some of the old um, suppliers as it was. And I think that has implications for what happens to Sakarya uh, when it happens um, going forward. I look at Romania, um, uh, oil and gas companies in Romania, so um, it makes sense to talk a little bit about what's going on in Romania, um, and then, then we can see how this fits into um, the Turkish discovery. So um, back in 2012, ExxonMobil and their, their Romanian um, 
partner, OMV Petrom, discovered some gas in the, in the deep waters of the Black Sea. It's the first major discovery in, in the, the deep waters of the Black Sea. And at the time we were told it was between 42 and 84 BCM. Um, there hasn't been any other any updates on, on the volumes uh, since then, so we assume that it's somewhere around that, that amount. But, but because of regulatory reasons, um, this still hasn't been developed. So the, the companies have still not managed to get to the final investment decision stage. Um, we believe and management of the companies believe this will happen in 2021, uh, but there's been a very long delay because of the, the regulatory issues there. There's another project in Romania, the Trident project, which is operated by Lukoil. Um, we think there's around about 30 BCM there, and this project is further back than, than the Neptune project. And we heard just in the last two or three days that Lukoil is looking to get out of this project. Um, at the same time, Exxon is looking to sell their stake in the Neptune project. And this, this does raise the question of the commerciality of these two um, projects. So if you take yourself back a couple of years, the natural gas prices in, in Europe were somewhere between 20 and 25 euros per megawatt hour. And that, that's enough to make any, any project like this attractive. Today, it's more like 15. Um, a few months ago, it was as low as five. So when you're making a, a major investment decision like this, you obviously have to have a view on where gas is going to be five years, 10 years from now. But if the gas price today is very low, um, it's natural to be a little bit more pessimistic about where that natural gas price is going to go. In Bulgaria, there's a, a, a project called Han, Han Aspura. Um, it's operated by Total. Um, OMV Petrom, the Exxon uh, partner in Romania, is the partner in that one as well. We don't know anything about uh, how much they found there. There's still more exploration to go. Um, but there could be something um, in Bulgaria as well. And last but not least, there's a company called Black Sea Oil and Gas that's actually bringing on some gas, maybe at the end of next year, maybe the beginning of 2022. It's a one BCM per year project. Um, the recoverable reserves are about 10 BCM. And this will be the first of the, the um, major projects offshore. Um, in the Black Sea. And one BCM, to put it into to perspective, Romania is about 10 BCM market. Um, so it's about 10% 10 um, 10 of that market. One project that often got brought up when the, um, the news was released of Sakaria was the Zor project, which Orkan has already mentioned. It's, it's an amazing mega um, project is 850 BCM and the the outstanding thing about this project was the the rate of development so normally uh, you know we were talking about the projects in in Romania which got stuck on regulations and and eight years later they don't have an FID um, here we have from discovery to gas was just a, a little bit above two years however uh, we have a whole host of infrastructure in place in this um, region, e ENI was able to do an undersea, uh, a subsea completion, a pipeline back to an existing platform, and that was how they're able to open the first phase of gas. If you don't have any other platforms around, if you don't have that kind of infrastructure, then you can't choose to go down that pathway, even if you want to have this finished really, really quickly. And so um, Zor is probably not a very good comparison when you're looking at how the uh, tuna discovery is going to be developed. So when it was first announced, it was 320 BCM. It, it, it was a second discovery took it up to three, uh, 405 BCM. As Orkan said, we're not 100% sure um, it, what these numbers uh, represent because there's there's lots of different ways of representing resources or reserves um, depending on how certain you are that they're commercial um, but you know whatever however we we define that these numbers they're pretty big numbers and the area um, of that license that's actually being explored is is quite small the license is very big 
So there, there's the probability that this could be become even bigger. There's already a pre-feed contract in place. Um, so somebody is working, I'm not sure if, if Okan knows who this is, somebody is, is doing a, a basic um, engineering work to see, to design the way in which this is going to be developed. Unlike the example I gave in Romania, obviously this is a project that has backing from the, the very top. So we wouldn't expect there to be regulatory issues that got in the way of this project being developed. And um, in, in gas, one of the most important questions is the question of monetization. If you, if you discover oil, you stick it on a ship, you send it anywhere in the world, you don't have to worry about who's going to buy it. With gas, the most important thing is where you're going to sell it because there needs to be a, either a pipeline or there needs to be an LNG um, investment in between the, the customer and, and the pr producer. Here, we don't have that problem. So the Turkish market is, is something like a 45 BCM gas market with economic growth. It could get bigger depending obviously on, on um, investments, how investments go in the power sector. But there's a, there, doesn't, there isn't any market risk here with this um, project. And there are other, uh, other markets to the West which would be happy to take off some of this gas if it were to, were to become available. But on the other side, this is, this is a very challenging project. It's in more than 2000 meters of, of water. The Black Sea environment is, is a challenging one. It's very corrosive. Um, the infrastructure needs to be built from scratch. And as I said before, gas prices, they're low by historic standards. And whoever makes the final investment decision here has to, I think, be hoping that um, gas prices will go up. Of course, the larger the scale, the lower the gas prices you can live with because you have economies of scale, but still, um, I think that's an issue that um, is a challenge for those that are putting together this, this project. So um, how, will, how will Turkey benefit from this project, uh, assuming that it goes ahead uh, and given you know, all the, the things that we don't know? Obviously, there's going to be a current account defi uh, deficit effect if Turkey is able to start producing significant amounts of natural gas. Um, it does provide extra bargaining power for contract renewals, um, although I question the extent to which that is true for a number of reasons. There, there's construction and engineering work. There's, you know, there's lots of jobs that are going to be created somewhere uh, in order to, to put this together. Turkey is, is trying to... Um, create a gas hub at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of work going into trying to, to create a gas hub in Turkey. And this would obviously have a, uh, a positive impact on that. And then maybe, you know, relations with neighbors, if, if you can provide some diverse, diversity of supply to some of your neighbors, um, I'm sure that wouldn't go amiss. Um, but my biggest question with this project right from the beginning is, is, the, is the question of materiality. So I think it's, there's some obvious benefits to be had here, but, but how important is it really? There's been very big structural changes in gas pricing. So traditionally gas pricing was oil in indexed. It was for very long term because you needed the confidence to be able to build the infrastructure. And many of Turkey's gas contracts are coming to an end and we would expect in the current market that, that what replaced them, whether it was LNG or, or, or pipeline, would be a lot more flexible and would much more likely to be gas indexed rather than oil indexed or, or more gas indexed. The existing LNG terminals have already benefited the Turkish market by being able to take advantage of, of spot cargoes in particular um, and take advantage of those really low, uh, low gas prices. There's significant investment in, in um, storage going on in Turkey. It's quite small at the moment, but there's very big ambitions and storage um, helps you with all of these, these issues as well. There, there's going to be at least one or two nuclear power plants built. Um, so will this eat away at the, the, um, the demand for gas in Turkey along with, with increased renewables? Um, and we don't know anything about how much this is going to cost and what the break-evens would be. Just as a, um, a little 
uh, hint here. Um, if, if you if you think that at the moment the price of gas in Europe is is about fifteen euros per per um, megawatt hour, that's equivalent to about one hundred and forty five um, euros per BCM. And if we say we got four hundred and five BCM. That's equivalent to about 60, 60 billion euros or $65 billion. And even if we take quite, a, uh, quite optimistic assumptions on how much we can see, how much gas we can see coming per annum from this um, project, uh, it's, you know, it's nice, but it doesn't make that much difference to a $750 billion economy with a $35 billion uh, current account deficit. So that's, that's it from me, thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thanks for this informative um, presentation. Now it's time to shift our gears to geopolitical implications. And uh, Anna, the floor is yours. We have, uh, you have 12 minutes uh, for your speech. Sorry for the time limits. We would like to allocate some time for the uh, participants' questions as well. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I think I will need to uh, somehow share my screen, I believe. Uh... Jonathan, could you please... Uh... I need to stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, let me see if I can... How do I share my screen? Okay, here it is. Here it is. Share and... Uh... Perfect. Go back. So, well, thank you so much for having me here and also for those great presentations which, which really set up, uh, provide a great setup for what I want to say and kind of let me not to have to tell all these details about the economics and the issue and that, that, that the issues that kind of uh, rule or, or are visible in the region. So I've been looking in general at geopolitics of natural gas in the Central Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe with relation to Russia. Um, and I have recently been looking at Southeast Europe and, and the region of Black, uh, Black Sea because it's not only because of the discoveries that we've seen, but because there is a very interesting dynamics there uh, that has been that has evolved um, since the 1990s to a very different uh, status that it's now. And just uh, just bear with me here. So the Black Sea region, we can talk about the Black Sea region as just the littoral states, right? Of Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine, Russia, Georgia, and Turkey. But also um, I think with in, in terms of uh, gas and geopolitics of natural gas, I think that the neighbors are quite important and that will include Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Moldova. All these countries have interests in the Black Sea region and are one way or another related to uh, natural gas and, in, and its transfer, um, as well as the geopolitical relations that occur uh, based on uh, natural gas uh, transfers and production and sales. So uh, here you see the pipeline routes uh, that go from Russia and, and all the way to Eastern and Southeast Europe. And one thing that is very significant here is um, that those, um, the pipeline maps show really the kind of heritage that, uh, that the region actually, what, what the region inherited from the Soviet uh, uh, era, where pipelines really kind of were going one direction only. And there, are, there has been very few interconnections. And I should have probably put up here a, a map, which I, I apologize, I didn't, um, that shows the difference, difference between that region to the east of Europe and the Western Europe, where you see those interconnections crisscrossing uh, and, and also the pipelines uh, being much uh, connected to each other, countries uh, connected to each other in a much uh, expansive way. This is starting to happening in, uh, in the region, however, and that's when you, were, when you see already the blue stream, stream, the south stream, all the types of the interconnectors that we've seen uh, in Southeast Europe, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe as well. So um, let's let's talk about the region a little bit. I think one underlying feature of the re of the region 
uh, what really connects connects it together is its diversity. It's and really kind of lack of clear geopolitical affiliation. Uh, so the countries that are there are really belonging to different uh, almost different uh, associations. So we see e countries that are um, either part of EU or aspiring to be um, within the EU. I'm sorry. Okay, um, either aspiring to be in the EU, the countries that, that uh, are actually uh, connected with, like Armenia, with Russia, um, countries that are within NATO, that are aspiring to be in NATO, that are in partnerships with NATO, that are neutral, um, but also countries that are in collective security treaty organization, the Eurasian NATO that's under the Ru Russian influence. So it's a this very uh, expensive extensive diversity, which, which makes it difficult for the region to have some underlying goals, um, almost more than, than we see in Central and Eastern Europe, which is kind of less diverse in that, in that, um, in that, uh, uh, in that way. Um, and that's when, when we see kind of these, these, uh, these uh, difficulties of countries to connecting the, their policies to, to provide a one kind of block, which could uh, support specific goals and so on. However, the way um, actually I see currently natural gas, this is something that can make the region somewhat more um, regional, <laughs> somewhat more connected. And part of it is because uh, the countries that are within the region, they are also diverse with respect to natural gas. Uh, so there are countries that have domestic supplies like Russia, Ukraine, or Romania. Uh, some countries are self-sufficient, Russia, Romania kind of, uh, because it still receives a little bit of, of gas, uh, and probably Jonathan knows it better than I, a little bit gas from Russia, although I think not from Gazprom. And there are countries that are suppliers, uh, and we're talking here about Russia, uh, which is a supplier, and then Azerbaijan, if we include the neighbors, Iran, um, and then there is an LNG supply, with, which uh, also Jonathan has pointed uh, that uh, Turkey, especially Turkey, has been now uh, really connected to uh, many suppliers, including uh, like 10 uh, LNG suppliers, and that includes, um, includes US, uh, for example, but also other countries. So uh, Jonathan talked about the discovery of the Turkish tuna, right? Uh, that uh, So we have that kind of covered, but I think it's adding additional kind of part of the of the equation there's more 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 to 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 to, to gas uh, in the black sea um, because we do have those discoveries within the region that are ongoing and we've seen that that there's a neptune deep uh, discovery and now the turkish discovery so what does it mean well first thing if, if we go back all the way to all the way to 1990s, we see that um, the, the the region with regards to uh, with regards to natural gas is heavily dependent on Russia. Uh, Russia is mainly is the country that provides most, if not all, the gas to the country to the countries that do not have that or that are lacking some of the gas that are not able to produce 100% of its uh, of its consumption. And uh, in a way, um, this not this not only provides Russia with economic power, but also provides Russia with geopolitical power. And we have seen those issues that Russia, for example, and Ukraine have had with regards to natural gas, where, where they kind of were, you know, bickering about, well, you know, we, we uh, first Russia extends uh, ability to, uh, to uh, get debt and uh, cheap prices for Ukraine. But then when Ukraine is willing to move to uh, working together with the European Union, Russia kind of, you know, takes it back and, uh, and asks for that repayment and increases the prices to actual uh, commercial levels. Um, and while Ukraine should have probably expected that this could happen, uh, well, the, the issue persisted and we ended up actually with, uh, with uh, some of natural gas not reaching uh, uh, Western Europe and, and, and further out uh, to, the, to the West from Ukraine. And because Russia would decrease the, um, decrease the uh, pressure on the pipelines um, and Ukraine would siphon some of the gas that would be, uh, was, uh, was supposed to go to further to the West, arguing that it's needed to maintain the, uh, uh, the pipelines. All in all, we've seen that there has been an issue within, within, uh, within that region. And we've seen in general, 
Russia has been more than willing to use energy supplies and especially gas, which kind of, you know, traditionally is just connected with the pipeline. You don't have other uh, other way of getting it. So you're kind of destined to have to uh, have it um, uh, brought by Russia. Um, and Russia has, has not been shy using it uh, geopolitically. So we've seen this, but we also have seen this huge change that occurred. And um, Okan, Okan was talking here about offshore, offshore, but also about unconventional resources, and then a development of much broader, much deeper, much more liquid LNG market. And that has changed not only the, 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 the region, but generally global way in which we think about gas. Because now, as long as infrastructure is in place, gas can actually travel and be brought to, you know, to, uh, uh, to Turkey via LNG and so on. Well, that has, I think, created opportunity. Uh, in particular for Turkey, but also generally in the region, because what what really it brings uh, it go, uh, it gets into is that it decreases the geopolitical power of Russia in the region. Uh, Turkey, by smart investment, by diversifying its supply, I think increased it. Um, diversifying its supply, but also um, Turkey putting itself in the position of the middleman of natural gas for for Europe um, has has actually accrued quite a lot of geopolitical power uh, with uh, you know with versus Russia, but also generally in the region. And in a way, if Turkey is able to apply that uh, that influence uh, regionally and connect with other countries who are interested in diversifying their resources. And if there is enough of uh, infrastructure investment, we could think of really kind of the region switching. And I think it already has to, to some extent from this dominance, geopolitical dominance of Russia in the region to more kind of uh, dual dominance or, 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 or balance dominance between Turkey and potentially the countries that are bandwagoning uh, with, with Turkey and, and, and Russia. And if they are able to, if, if that connects the region, I think it, it, there is a way of, of uh, advancing the, the, the countries that are there, the country's energy security in particular. And that's where I think that one thing that, that, that goes, um, that connects with, uh, with what Jonathan was saying with the, the issue of what's, what's, economic, what's, ec what's the economic value? Is, it, is there economic uh, reason for, for, uh, for actually bringing up uh, the, the natural gas from, from either Neptune or, or from, uh, from, from the tuna uh, discovery? Well, it probably will also depend on the energy security consideration of the states. And it, actually, with um, I was just reading a couple of days ago, Romanian state uh, is uh, seems to be willing to buy the the Exxon stake in the Neptune discovery, and and it seems that it, that the Turkish state is very much involved and wants the Turkish state be involved in the uh, in the discovery, or at least Turkish companies be involved in the discovery, um, uh, uh, in the tuna uh, field. So. I think it will depend probably on the perception of energy security by countries that are involved um, to some to, to, to some extent whether or not they will want to uh, they will want to invest in development of those fields. Um, now this energy security issue has been diminished because of the changes that I was just talking about because of the changes of increasingly liquid, much uh, much better interconnected and diversified. And natural gas, uh, natural gas market, and the fact that Turkey has been bringing, uh, has has invested in LNG terminals, in storage. I think the storage that they have, the, the current uh, development of storage is the largest current development of storage in the world, and it's supposed to bring in the storage to 5.4 BCMs uh, uh, once it's completed. Um, uh, also. Um, nuclear power although it's interesting because russia works with uh, turkey works with russia on the nuclear power so uh, that diversification kind of creates slightly less of an Im impact uh, that the uh, that the discovery could make um, i think i'll stop at that because i think my time is uh, is up uh, but i'm really looking forward to answering any questions and the discussion Thank you very much, Anna. Thanks for this great presentation and uh, sharing your views with us. And uh, Dimitri, it's your time. 
uh, it's good to see you here in Zoom and it's good to see you in Oxford. Uh, welcome and uh, you have 12 minutes. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much. Well, I don't have that much to add because the previous speakers went so uh, extensively into both the economic but all geological side, if you will, but also the geopolitical implications. Maybe I'll just make a, a few comments, mostly looking at the downstream countries uh, in Southeast Europe. Um, uh, I, I definitely agree with Anna that what Turkey is doing is a blueprint for the region, uh, diversifying supplies uh, away from Russia. So Turkey historically has been, uh, since Blue Stream came uh, um, about, the second largest uh, customer for, for Russian natural gas uh, in Europe. But uh, in previous years, starting in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, the share of Russian gas uh, on the Turkish market has gone uh, uh, rapidly down. Um, and uh, th that might occur in other uh, countries uh, as well. Uh, Greece is already showing that, uh, thanks to uh, the energy boost uh but then again uh, greece has the infrastructure it has the Rebitos ter terminal which supplies the, the city of athens and much of the south and now the question is what happens with uh with northern greece uh, because you have this bottleneck between north and the south and also northern greece with uh, the, the terminal that is uh, being now uh, under uh, um, not under construction, but it's making headways in Alexandropolis. I think it will have important uh, economic, but also political consequences for, for Greece's neighbors. Um, Bulgar Transgas, the Bulgarian grid operator, has acquired 20% uh, of the venture. Uh, and there is an issue about wrong gas. I'm not private to the discussions why, why wrong gas hasn't done so, but it's a story to watch because this is happening. Um, also, the, the other uh, LNG terminal uh, in the region, uh, on the other side, in, in the Adriatic, uh, on the city of, on the island of Kirk in, in Croatia, is also making headway. So the future of gas uh, in Southeast Europe will be looking very different from uh, what we have uh, right now with, with a variety of suppliers. Um, beyond LNG, it's also Azeris um, uh, with TANAP. Uh, and TAP uh, coming coming online, uh, obviously TANAP is there, but TAP is now uh, nearing completion. Uh, Bulgar Gas, the state um, trading company and bubbled uh, from Bulgar Gas, uh, has a contract for one BCM uh, with um, with the Shag Denis Consortium, which is about one third uh, of uh, the country's consumption. Um, so if uh, everything goes right, uh, there will be much more gas available on the market. Um, uh, and uh, when all those countries will be renegotiating uh, their long-term supply contracts with, with Gazprom, and again, Turkey uh, is planting the flag here with the expiry of the Western route contracts next year, and then the Blue Stream contracts in 2025. But when uh, the negotiations are um, coming up, uh, it will be a, a slightly different conversation. Um, most notably on the take or pay clause, which is uh, the sticking point. Uh, and the other uh, problem with um, uh, oil indexing, and I'm not an expert on this one, I think there are more qualified people to comment on this one. But with low oil prices, I think this is not uh, uh, the main uh, contentious issue, but the take or pay clauses uh, is, is something that consumer countries have been pushing. Now, the only country that I see as, as problematic in that respect is, is Serbia. Uh, it's a relatively big consumer uh, in this region. And again, to open a parenthesis, you're talking about a bunch of countries that actually do not consume that much gas. Uh, um, we are in the range of three, four uh, BCM. Uh, much of the Western Balkans doesn't uh, doesn't need gas at all because there is no gasification and no gas infrastructure. I'm talking about countries like Kosovo, Montenegro, um, even Bosnia to some degree, but uh, certainly Albania. So Serbia stands out. And I think they've lagged behind pretty much everybody else uh, in terms of thinking about those issues of uh, interconnectivity and, and diversifying away from, from the Russians. Uh, 
you can see it even at the level of the extreme, and that will be the last point I'll make. Just to, um, um, uh, the venture, uh, the, the, lo the local venture to operate the extreme or Balkan stream in Serbia is majority owned uh, by Gazprom. It has a majority stake, which I think down the line will be an issue cropping up in Serbia's membership talks with, with the EU. Um, so uh, compared to Greece, but even Bulgaria, Serbia has further down the line in terms of uh, doing its, its job on, on, on gas diversification. And that's, that's a shame because it's not just about geopolitics, but also about uh, a lot of public uh, economic issues because gas might be a cheap alternative, especially if the market becomes competitive. But also it creates other public, um, public benefits, public policy benefits. Uh, if you look around Southeast Europe, uh, uh, pollution, air quality uh, has been a recurrent issue, and that's understandable. One of the factors is the overconsumption and over reliance on lignite, uh, especially in winter during heating season. Uh, if we tra transition to gas, um, the uh, environmental standards will, will improve as well. But since gas is coming only from one direction and it's too expensive, gasification is, 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 is lagging, uh, lagging behind. So in ideal circumstances, all those projects uh, to do with LNG, but also gas coming through Turkey will lead to um, um, expanded supply, will um, of course uh, open new opportunities for consumers, uh, for, for the industry across the region and, and create all kinds of benefits. But this is the ideal case scenario, the reality we live in um, you have in all those energy sectors a lot of vested interests, a lot of pushback from um, political factors, um, but also uh, industry industry players. So I don't think we're getting very um, quickly quickly there. In this ideal vision that also the European Commission has been promoting since 2009. Um, finally, a few words about the extreme. Um, oh, as of last week, uh, the the Russian uh, information agency TASS reported that the section in Bulgaria uh, is, has been completed. So, um, I mean, it means that all the compressor stations are, are there uh, in place. Um, we don't know how much transit there will be, how much gas will actually get sh shipped uh, from the Turkish border on, onward to Serbia and then there, there from to, to, to Hungary. Uh, but we know that uh, Russia has scored a lot of um, political points, and it turns out also it has made good money uh, all, on the works. Um, one of the stories in, in Bulgaria right now is that the Saudi consortium, uh, which won the tender uh, after legal battle to, to build the actual pipeline, is actually uh, has been subcontracting the work to a, a number of Russian outfits and also a company from Belarus. So Russia benefited commercially, but also geopolitically from the extreme uh, and managed, at least in the case of uh, Serbia, uh, less so maybe in Bulgaria, if um, Alexandrupolis and the Southern Gas Corridor uh, make headway. Um, but in the case of Serbia, it has locked uh, in, in supply and maybe delayed gasification and, and the, the, the arrival of gas to the rest of the, the, the Western Balkans. So those two trends, the inertia from the past and, and the new market realities. And that's, that's an important point to highlight in this discussion. Whatever politicians and strategists have been talking, you have to look at the numbers and if it makes economic sense. Um, so if, if that, that, that becomes a, a reality, we, we get to a very different place. But uh, again, I don't think uh, progress will be in many ways the, the pioneer and going back to where we started the, the discussion of things the tuna finds um, even with all the caveats about um, if, it, if it's recoverable if it uh, what is the break-even price and is unstable can you hear me yeah yeah this, this is better now yeah yeah 
Sorry for all right. I, I just wrapped up. I, I let, let's wrap up, and um, I, I was just saying that what Turkey have, what happens in Turkey might set a trend for the rest of the uh, region. Demo, demo, sorry to interrupt you. Demo, can, sorry to interrupt you. Can, can you bring the microphone closer to your mouth? Maybe that will be better. Um, yeah, I just wanted to wrap up. Can you can you hear me now? Uh, okay, so. Uh, I mean, the point I'm trying to, to make, and I'll let me finish here, is that um, looking at Southeast Europe, there's a lot of inertia, a lot of institutional uh, pushback and reforming the gas market, modernizing and, and making it more uh, connected and competitive. But Turkey is a trendsetter because of the size of the markets, uh, but also its, its ambitions and geographic location. So hopefully to use the tuna find to uh, proceed with diversification and also marketization of its uh, natural gas sector and that will have a ripple effect to, to neighboring countries. So we see a bit of that already in Greece and Bulgaria. Hopefully that will be felt also in, in the Western Balkans. So let me stop here and apologies for the poor quality of the sound. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. And the uh, microphone uh, was better at the, at the end. And uh, thank you very much to all speakers for these informative presentations and sharing your opinions uh, with us. I had some kickoff questions, but I can leave so many questions on the right side of the screen. That's why I will not ask because I really wonder the answers of the participants' questions. Uh, just a reminder, our webinar will not be recorded 